Hello and good morning, everybody. Good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name is Florian Dur, and I'm an Associate Professional Officer at FAO North America. It is my pleasure to serve as your moderator today. On behalf of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and our distinguished speakers, welcome to this webinar on reducing food loss and waste during COVID-19 and beyond. Feel free to let us know who you are and from where you're joining us in the chat box. We encourage you to post your questions to our panelists throughout the webinar in the Q&A box at the center bottom of your screen. Kindly state your name and affiliation and to whom your question is directed. During the Q&A session, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Follow us on Twitter at FAO North America and join the conversation using the hashtag FAO Insights and Food Waste. Make sure to read the full bios of our distinguished speakers today, which will be posted in the chat box. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Food loss and waste, of course, is not a new problem, but it has gained increased attention due to the COVID-19 pandemic. High levels of food loss and waste, while millions of people go hungry, has always been a central contradiction in our food systems. As millions of people around the world lose their jobs and livelihoods due to the pandemic, news about fresh produce being plowed under, milk being wasted, potatoes being buried, and livestock being euthanized, have become especially unbearable, multiplying the urgency to address this issue. Let me give you a brief overview of the event. Today, we will hear from leading experts on how to tackle food loss and waste holistically amid the pandemic, on a global scale and in North America specifically. We will hear from FAO experts, ambassadors, policymakers, the private sector, and the two biggest food rescue and hunger relief organizations in the US and Canada. After welcoming remarks from Melinda Sharan, Director of FAO North America, we are honored to hear from Ambassador Belefi how San Marino and Andorra played a key role in establishing an International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. Rosa Rolle, who leads FAO's work on food loss and waste reduction, will present key recommendations for action based on a recently published policy brief. After this global perspective, we are honored to hear from a distinguished panel on the North American perspective. Before coming to the Q&A session, answering questions from you, the audience, Carola Fabi will present FAO's new and innovative big data tool on food chains under the COVID-19 pandemic, underscoring the importance of data and information for evidence-based responses and policies. Without further ado, let me hand over to Valinda Sharan, Director of the FAO Liaison Office for North America. Mr. Sharan brings with him more than two decades of national and international government leadership experience focusing on rural development, agriculture, and food security issues. Wim Lendra, over to you. Thanks, Florian, and hello, everyone. While Florian was speaking, I just did a quick check on the registrants and found that over 700 people have registered, and they're coming from all parts of the world, and that clearly establishes the level of interest that we have in this topic across the globe. It's not surprising the though COVID-19 is primarily a health pandemic, it has in its aftermath left a global economy contracting by nearly 5%. And many businesses, including those in food and agriculture sector, doddering on the verge of collapse and closure. The pandemic's impact on food loss and food waste has been immense. Disrupted supply chains, closure of permanent or temporary food processing units, workers' health, shrinking consumer demands, have all had a deep impact on how agriculture food is being handled from consume and consumed from farm to fork. As Florian was mentioning, it's not that these problems did not exist. They did. It's just that COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation and widened and exposed the chinks in our armor to confront food loss and waste. In these welcome remarks, I would not like to take a deep dive into the issue. We have a galaxy of experts with us today to do so and present to you for your consideration, the policy implications and possible solutions to combat food loss and waste. However, I must take this opportunity to draw your attention to an excellent knowledge product which came out of FAO last year. The 2019 State of Food and Agriculture, so far as we know it. The publication 
from defining food loss and waste to helping us understand the varying impact of reducing food loss and waste along the value chain on food security and nutrition and or on greenhouse gas emission. The report is an excellent resource for anyone interested in the issue. The standardized methodology developed by FAO to measure food loss from production to retail level will go a long way in helping us assess our progress to SDG 12.3, which calls for halving global food loss and waste. I invite all of you to take a close look at SOFA 2019 and I think perhaps our communication team can put a link to that publication in the chat box for easy access. Excessive food loss and waste is completely unacceptable in a world where almost a billion people go hungry and the pressure on natural resources are increasing. Reducing food loss and waste is not only a moral imperative, it's also an economic and environmental one. In fact, it presents a logical and transformative opportunity to address major drivers of global environmental degradation and loss of biodiversity, while simultaneously helping achieve food security and nutrition. I look forward to hearing a variety of perspectives from experts from FAO, food banks, private sector actors, and others on the issue, including those of Congresswoman Pingree, member of Congress from Maine, and co-chair of the Food Recovery Caucus and His Ex Excellency Ambassador Bellefe, permanent rep of San Marino to the United Nations, USA and Canada. In December of 2019, led by San Marino and Andorra, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution to designate 29th September as the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. Today, we do not have the pleasure of hearing from her but I must acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Balmana, Perm Rep of Andorra to the UN at the webinar today. Ambassador Belafi is, serving, is serving as a member of the Credential Committee of the 74th session of the General Assembly of the UN, and in the past has served as facilitator in the second committee for the resolution entitled International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste, presented by San Marino and Andorra during the 74th session of the General Assembly of the UN. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this event and to invite Ambassador Belafi to take the floor and offer his remarks. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Director, for your generous presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. And first of all, let me uh, congratulate you for, uh, for a for organizing such an important event and also for inviting me to participate to this, on this panel. I believe I'm here today to say something about the initiative carried out by San Marino uh, together with Andorra, which brought to the adoption on November 2019 in the second committee of the General Assembly first, and then in December of the same year in the plenary of the General Assembly of the resolution entitled the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. Let me start by explaining why it is important to speak about food loss and waste in the middle of a global uh, health crisis. There are many countries that have been hit hard by the COVID-19 and that are suffering. Uh, there are also many countries that are now fighting against uh, the negative consequences, both socio-economic and humanitarian, of this pandemic. We are all together in this difficult and challenging time, and what we need now is a strong spirit of solidarity, friendship among nations, and let me say a very strong United Nations. Promoting the awareness of food loss and waste uh, uh, could help to mitigate the potential negative impact of food security and nutrition in this very complicated situation. San Marino and Andorra led the negotiation of the United Nations resolution, which designated the 29th of September as International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. This resolution received more than 60 co-sponsor countries, which is a very good sign of interest on this topic. 
The creation of an international day against food loss and waste could be the best occasion to sensitize the public opinion to the importance of the issue and be a catalytic factor for creating synergies at all levels. The resolution it identifies the FAO as the leading agency for its implementation and stress the need that any action would have to be carried out in accordance with national priorities, which is a point very important. While 821 million people are suffering from anger and malnutrition, about $1 trillion of food is lost or wasted every year. This is a paradox that we believe needs to be addressed. So according to the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, reversing this trend would preserve enough food to feed 2 billion people. Global hunger isn't about a lack of food. The world produces enough food to nourish every man, woman, and child on the planet. But nearly one third of all food produced each year is squandered or spoiled before it can be consumed. As we know, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, 12 among its objectives includes to halve per capita global food waste at the retail and consumer level and reduce food losses along production and supply chains by 2030. Last summer, San Marino organized an event at the UN together with the European Union and Andorra and many other co-sponsors in order to promote an international response on this topic. And following the discussion of this event, we thought that it was extremely important to establish an international day of awareness, food loss and waste, to create a momentum for an international joint effort. In this regard, it is fundamental that governments, private sector, NGOs, continue to work together to raise awareness of the value of food and on the serious risks of food waste and actively involving citizens in the promotion of sustainable development models. The Republic of San Marino takes food loss and waste very seriously. I believe I have no time in this presentation to describe the initiatives carried out in San Marino on this topic in the recent years. We are now discussing in San Marino various projects to implement on the occasion of the celebration of the International Day. One of these initiatives is, for example, the issue of a postage stamp to celebrate the International Day. I would like to conclude this uh, presentation by saying that we are living a crisis a kind of tragedy that hits every country in one way or another, every citizen of the world. Building back better from COVID-19 offers us the unique opportunity for pursuing a transformative recovery, which brings us to build more inclusive and more sustainable development societies where no one will be left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, Balefi, and thank you also again to Ambassador Vives Balmania of Andorra for your important leadership in passing this resolution. So, um, could you let us know what led San Marino and Andorra to lead this very important international process? As I tried to also cover this, this question in my presentation, we understood that uh, uh, we need at some point uh, to join effort for an international response because the paradox that we have in front of us is that we have enough food to nourish every man, woman and child on the planet. But at the same time, the waste of food and the loss of food is uh, so much that will create this paradox so that we have enough food but we can use it because we squander which spoil is, is simply is lost and wasted. One trillion of food is wasted or lost every year. So uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, problem that uh, cannot be solved just by uh, a 
single and uh, one country. We need to join our effort and work together in order to address problems like this. That means that we have to strengthen and we have to renew an international cooperation on this, on this, on this topic. One of the things that uh, it was important for us to do is before to raise awareness on this topic and the idea to uh, present a resolution uh, in order to establish an international day of awareness of food loss and waste, uh, way, um, food loss and waste was, was important for us. At the same time, it was a kind of a coincidence of the testing. We, we, we knew that we went to uh, the office of FAO to present this resolution. We discovered that FAO uh, last year, during the month of June, if I'm not mistaken, the director will correct me if I'm mistaken, uh, adopted a resolution asking the Secretary General to, um, to, 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 uh, to establish through a resolution international day on this topic. So we had uh, Andorra and San Marino and FAO more or less in the same time, the same idea. So the process uh, that we started was uh, supported strongly by the FAO. And thanks to the FAO, we also uh, we'd be able to have a very important and strong resolution. Uh, that's the reason why we, we, we succeed also. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, indeed, congratulations again for the passing of the resolution, and uh, which is of utmost importance not only to FAO, but really to the whole global community in its effort to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we encourage all of you participants to observe, observe the first ever International Day of Awareness on Food Loss and Waste this 29th of September. And we encourage you to, to use the remaining three months to think about your own campaigns and events on this important occasion. Uh, where we work, where we shop, where we eat and what we eat has changed during the pandemic. Between lockdowns, travel restrictions, reduced air freight, consumer panic buying and abruptly lacking demand from restaurants, schools and other institutional buyers, food supply chains have seen dramatic disruptions and require new and creative ways to avoid that food is being lost or wasted. We will hear more about this topic from Rosa Rolle, who is a Senior Enterprise Development Officer in FAO's Nutrition and Food Systems Division, where she leads a team working on food loss and waste reduction. Her almost 25 years career in FAO includes seven years at the regional office for Asia and Pacific. Rosa holds a PhD in food science from Ohio State University in the United States. Dear Rosa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good day, good evening, everyone. Um, my presentation uh, today is titled and focused on mitigating risks to food systems during COVID-19, uh, reducing food loss and waste. Um, much of what I will present is actually um, based on a number, the compilation and analysis of a number of uh, reports, uh, news and media reports. Um, now, as was highlighted by Ambassador Belfev, the coronavirus um, pandemic has really highlighted to us a number of weaknesses in the our food systems. Food supply chains across the globe have been disrupted by blockages and transport on in transport routes, transport resist, uh, restrictions, and also quarantine measures during a number of lockdowns that have taken place globally. And this has re also resulted in significant increases in food loss and waste, especially of perishable produce, such as fruits and vegetables, uh, fish, meat, and dairy products. Um, and then the traditional supply chains of fruits and vegetables in most developing countries have been very strongly impacted um, and threatening the food security in many of these countries 
um, in both the rural and the urban sectors. Now, when we look at uh, this chart, what I would like to highlight to you is the differences um, between the, the, the different char generalized characteristics of the traditional supply chains, which are those chains that feed mass markets in, these, in the developing world and they predominate versus the modern systems, which would be what we can characterize as a value chain that is very well equipped with the technology um, and the logistics systems um, it, to support and facilitate access to high-end markets as well as to trade. Whereas if you look at the green column, um, what you have here are a number of production-driven trade chains with stakeholders who often lack technical capacity, uh, knowledge, and also they have limited uh, competitive organizational, organizational capacities or capital to invest in new technologies to be able to upgrade their practices. Uh, the levels of these uh, losses in these chains can go as high on, under normal circumstances before pre-COVID, for example, up to 50%. And uh, nevertheless, as we say, as I've highlighted, the bulk of the food supply action in many developing countries is based on these types, categories of traditional supply chains. I have to move my slide. Okay. okay, so this slide is intended to provide some perspective on the some of the actions and the technologies that I'm talking about when I refer to these supply chains. Um, because FAO has done a lot of field work, and that's one of the main target groups that we work with in many of our, in many of the countries that we support. Um, to look at the critical loss points in these traditional supply chains. And indeed, we consistently see transport systems as a, a critical loss point um, in fruit and vegetable supply chains with uh, inadequate and poor packaging as a major underlying cause. But when you look more closely at the various actions that are taking place in these supply chains, you see that uh, the manual hauling of produce, if you see the guy with the basket on his back, why? Because there's a lack of infrastructure, feeder roads to connect the farms, especially in mountainous areas to major roads. Um, you also see the number of times that produce has to change hands before it actually gets to a market. Every time it has to change hands and it's handled, what happens, you have quality loss. And then when it gets to the market, it's packaged in the single use plastic bags where you have, again, unsustainable practice, environmental practice, where you have a lot of sweating, accelerating the rate of decay and spoilage. Um, and also, if you look at the number, take note of the number of individuals that are involved in the different steps of every supply chain. With COVID, Uh, what we see, which we, we have seen, is shortages in labor. It's not moving. Okay, sorry. Um, shortages in labor uh, in the supply chains of this type have resulted in food being left unharvested in the fields and also increased the transit times between the farm and the market. In many of these traditional supply chains, the transit time under ambient conditions is 24 to 48 hours. But now they're averaging three, even up to five days. And the lack of working capital, affordable inputs, and difficulties in sourcing inputs is also a major issue that is resulting in really low quality crop outputs in a number of countries. Also, with a number of international border uh, border closures coupled with national and subnational lockdowns, trade in agriculture produce and related value chains has significantly reduced a, cas in a cascading 
backward impact and it all and that goes all the way to the palm gate level with adverse effects on the small scale processors as well as on the incomes the livelihoods of small holders and of course high levels of food loss and waste when we look at what is happening on the demand side the onset of the pandemic i can't get those slides to change here has changed uh, a lot of the the food um the food consumption habits in in many developing countries what we have seen across a lot of the literature is um a number of people opting now to eat more processed foods there's less uh, shopping in markets and over time what we have also begun to see is that um, there is a re reduced uh, purchasing in markets owing to poor quality but also because of uh, reduced consumer access to to uh, income and so therefore needless to say that in order to avert food crisis government attention is consistently now and increasingly focused in countries on addressing food security issues to ensure and then to also to ensure health um, and income opportunities to be able to provide and uh, make available uh, fresh foods that are safe and accessible and nutritious to consumers so what i have What I have done is to look at some of the policy issues and some of the policy responses um, to curb these losses in the traditional supply chains. Um, what I'm trying to do is to actually highlight some of those examples that are actually being implemented where we have actually had the chance to interface with the, some, some of the stakeholders implementing these policy actions, but also um, areas that we feel could be better addressed. Many countries have begun to implement a number of strategic measures and, in, and interventions to strike a balance in terms of focusing on health while keeping those critical supply chains operational. In some cases, we have seen, uh, for example, the, the provision of education materials to vendors and consumers in other cases again we're not talking a very highly literate a highly literate uh, um, audience so the awareness raising campaigns being implemented in markets through farmer field schools through the active community groups like the Demetria groups that have been formed in in countries as well as through community radio there are a number of mitigation measure, measures that are being put in place in markets, for example, the provision of facilities uh, to facilitate better hygiene. And also, to a large extent, FAO in a number of countries is actually facilitating um, and the, the whole issue of addressing um, this awareness, um, these types of awareness campaigns, to a large extent also through some of its uh, farm or field schools. Next slide. Okay, to assure continued production and to maintain produce quality in, in fresh markets, the policy response has been to make available loans uh, to be able to support and facilitate access to inputs um, because this has been a major problem, the, the issue of uh, poor output quality in, at the field production level. There's also a, a number of um, initiatives across many countries to provide subsidies for the procurement of key inputs. In some cases, governments have been distributing seeds, and not only in rural areas, but also in urban centers to help um, people to um, have access to food and to maintain their food secur security. Countries are also facilitating input and movement of seed and fertilizers within countries and putting in place systems to facilitate um, the mobility of 
seasonal workers and, and these seasonal workers are working all across the globe. You see time and again, these types of um, systems and are being put in place to ensure continuity. Next slide, please. So to address loss during handling, handling storage and distribution, we have seen a number of transport countries putting in place systems through the development of transport apps to facilitate logistical arrangements for food distribution. And many of these are being developed through public and private partnerships. In some cases, these partnerships also support some of these through public sector arrangements, some of these types of um, initiatives to be able to distribute food that is produced as widely as possible. Governments are also investing in building um, collection centers as a base to facilitate e-commerce. And we have also seen in countries a shift also toward the decentralization of cold storage facilities. And, but we still need, see the need and scope for increasing investment in bulk packaging to really to better manage the quality of produce and also to enhance environmental sustainability in terms of the initiatives and activities that are ongoing. Next slide, please. Governments are also increasingly facilitating the, the development of e-commerce uh, through training to help smallholders and businesses in the local marketing of produce in traditional supply chains. And particularly in the Asian region, this has been taking place as early as March of this year. And in the African region, you see a number of young people, the youth are taking up these types of initiatives. Large exporters are also making use of e-commerce um, in, um, in local markets in the case of, for example, Kenya, where they have actually begun to do a lot of their own private public, their own private partnerships to facilitate that. And also targeting um, alternative marketing opportunities, for example, um, using mom and pop shops, for example, to market the produce that they would normally have had to export. Exporter collaboration is also promoted am among producers in a number of countries to maximize the use of air, air freight. Um, and then FAO is doing its part by contributing also to training and capacity development to support uh, identification of market opportunities as well as good course harvest practice. Next slide, please. As I highlighted earlier in the, on the demand side issues, we, uh, there is an increase in demand and consumption of processed foods in a number of the developing countries. And therefore, it is, uh, what is now being taking place is the provision of grants uh, to incentivize smallholder value addition of perishables to reduce uh, the levels of loss and waste. We still need, see the need for greater support and attention to investment, for example, in on-farm processing through, for example, retractable mobile facilities, as well as to training in simple processing technologies that could be taken up by households and small groups of women uh, to help to assure their food security. And FAO is also supporting some of these types of work through projects in, in, in some of the regions. Um, there's also the need for the, the stockpiling of food of extended shelf life. I learned, for example, uh, through uh, this uh, media discussion that uh, the government of the Philippines, for example, has been during the, this crisis been providing ready to eat meals to the, some of the um, poorest of the poor. So now I'd like to look uh, at the issue of food waste. And what we have seen is um, the shortage, next slide, please, of uh, seasonal labor has resulted in considerable risk in the upstream segments of the food supply chains, particularly at the, during the early stages of the pandemic. And this has spurred the development and use of a number of supply 
blockchain innovations in a number of private entities, such as um, the use of automation, sensors, robotics, blockchain technologies, as well as innovative process, processing technologies. Um, in the downstream seg segments of the supply chains, countries have witnessed an exponential increase in demand for the services of uh, food banks and the food recovery and re redistribution initiatives. Coupled with this increase, many challenges and complications are also being faced by food banks. And several of them have also encountered uh, situations where they have had to temporarily close their doors um, and have faced reductions of uh, volunteers as well as donations because of uh, the, um, the, the volume, the rapid rate of increase. Policies uh, to reduce upstream, uh, the, the upstream risks have focused on, on the incentivizing, um, developing incentives to, to, to ease some of the import and export activities and also to ensure the continuity of production um, so that there is a consistent supply of uh, fresh foods, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, going into the different uh, streams. The promotion of alternative processing options is another issue that is constantly being discussed by many countries, for example, freezing, um, rapid freezing of fruits and vegetables. And that is happening apparently quite a bit now in the Asian context, as well as helping to develop linkages between producers and food banks to maximize the use of the food that is produced, the fruits and vegetables. Policy responses to support food banks have focused on increased support to, um, for example, um, policy, excuse me, policy responses have focused on increased support to food banks, charities, and also to assistance and support to a number of nutrition programs that address the youth and uh, women, in particular, the very vulnerable people. And then also there's been a number of efforts to focus on educating manufacturers and consumers and retailers to really understand and apply the best before and use by dates appropriately in order to maximize the use of food and uh, food and uh, redistribution efforts because uh, quite often even consumers um, are also being targeted for this because quite often a lot of food in Europe, for example, currently before, sorry, before the pandemic, you had up to 10% of food that was purchased by consumers being thrown away because of a lack of understanding of uh, these issues. So the next slide, please. To summarize, while to a large extent my presentation has highlighted areas for uh, government support for, and private public partnerships, we believe that collective efforts and innovative partnerships among a broad spectrum of stakeholders of coming from different segments and different sectors will have a significant impact in maximizing the use of food that we produce in ensuring food security for all and really to having an impact on reducing the high levels of food loss and waste that we have to now deal with um, because of the COVID pandemic. And this concludes my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Rosa, for your presentation. And it's indeed a daunting task to grasp everything that's going on around the globe, which is FAO's mandate. And thank you, Rosa, for reminding us that there's a difference between traditional and modern supply chains, and that while developing countries often face bigger problems in food loss, developed countries often face bigger issues in food waste. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. If you have questions for Rosa, make sure to post them in the Q&A box and we will try to get to them during the Q&A session. Um, we will now move from a global perspective to North America and focus on the US and Canada. 
and we are honored to have with us a distinguished panel on the North American perspective, featuring Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, Megan Stas from the Consumer Brands Association and the Food Waste Reduction Alliance, Blake Thompson from Feeding America and Laurie Nickel from Second Harvest Canada. We are really looking forward to your insights and learning how COVID-19 has impacted your important work on food recovery and hunger relief and which solutions you are championing. We will start with remarks from Representative Shelley Pingree, member of Congress for the First District of Maine and co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Food Recovery Caucus. As many of you might or might not know, Shelley Pingree actually is a farmer herself and started as an organic farmer on the small island of North Haven, Maine in the 1970s. In Congress, Shelley relies on her experience as a certified organic farmer to support the diverse range of American agriculture including sustainable, organic, and locally focused farming. As a member of the House Agriculture Committee and the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture, she has been vocal advocate for food policy reform. Pingree has pioneered legislation to reduce food waste across the American food system and is the founder and chair of the Food Recovery Caucus. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us today. You have the floor. Great, well, <clears throat> thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this time with you today and uh, for you to uh, gather all the speakers and participants together. Um, I have enjoyed listening to the uh, previous um, speakers and I think that if we just adopted the FAO guidelines, uh, thank you very much Rosa, we um, would be all set in the United States as well as anywhere in the world. Um, but I'm looking forward to hearing um, from all of you and many of the things that you are talking about and suggesting today and I will just give you a little bit of an update of where we are um, in the United States in, in a time that is extremely complicated for this issue and so many others. Um, I have actually been working on the issue of, of food waste for uh, quite a long time. And um, I have to say that this moment in time has brought a new level of attention, as all of you know, uh, while we're dealing with a global pandemic, um, but bringing that back to the United States, for many people it's the first time they have ever gone to the grocery store and seen empty shelves. And uh, they're also witnessing a whole variety of other experiences, whether it's long lines at the food bank or the situation that many American farmers are in today that have brought attention to this in a way we never could as a public policy discussion. Um, that's given us a, a lot of opportunity, I think, to look for solutions and, and talk about um, how to fix these problems at a difficult time. We, um, as I mentioned, have been working on this issue for a few years. I'm the co-chair of a bipartisan food waste caucus. I, I co-chair it with Representative Newhouse um, from the other coast in Washington state. And um, this has been a goal that uh, we've had. We've had the caucus since 2018 and the USDA has been working on some of these important guidelines to reduce food waste um, since 2015. So it's, it's not new to us. Um, several of the ideas you've been already discussing today are parts of pieces of legislation that I have sponsored. Um, I originally did a very comprehensive one called the Food Recovery Act, and of course we're happy to share any of these um, details with anyone or they're available also on our website. Um, but that's a very comprehensive piece of legislation to talk about everything that goes wrong in the system and, and how to deal with it. Everything from making donations easier for retailers, um, to addressing the very important um, issue that uh, was just mentioned, that's the Food Date Labeling Act. We, we understand that one of the um, most important things we could do for consumers is having uniformity of those labels, and we've made a lot of progress um, in, in working on those issues, so it's just perfectly clear to people when you should throw away food and when you shouldn't. Um, we have a proposal to do much more with uh, food waste issues um, in the schools because we believe that you know the younger you start to understand why it's not good to throw away food, what happens to it, the environmental impacts, um, what it is when people don't have access to food when they're going hungry every day. So um, that's grants and technical assistance to schools. Again, everything from helping students to be better engaged in the process to um, starting composting facilities in schools for that food that, that can't be used. Um, I also this year have introduced the Agricultural Resilience Act, which incorporates many of these things that we're talking about today and sets a goal of uh, reducing food waste by 75% by 2030. So we're anxious to, to move forward to, to get this done. And that act is really speaking to the issues around climate change, how we have our farmers and those in the food supply system much more engaged 
in the issues related to food waste, as well as um, the issues around carbon sequestration in the soil and the overall challenges of um, agriculture and climate change that we're dealing with today. So um, as I mentioned, we, we, with the USDA and with our colleagues in Congress have been working on this. It's actually, um, in spite of the contention we often have in Congress, it's a very bipartisan issue. I think that everybody's grandmother told them not to waste food. And people, when you, they hear these statistics that 30 to 50% of our food is wasted, um, they start to understand that this is a serious issue, particularly when you have people going hungry and when you're facing the environmental and resource challenges that we have today. So let me um, just fast forward a bit to the crisis that we're in today. As I said, we've, we've laid a lot of, of groundwork on this and, and done a lot of background. But today, in the midst of this pandemic, um, people are really seeing in a very different way the challenges with our supply chains and the challenges um, here in the wealthiest country in the world where we have an abundance of food, but it often doesn't get to the people who need it. Um, once again, we've, we've uh, had the chance for people to go into a grocery store for the first time and seen empty shelves, to have concerns about whether or not it's okay to eat certain foods or pick up the produce, what are the safety issues around eating food. Um, at the same time, they're watching um, television footage of farmers who are plowing under um, you know, hundreds of acres of, of vegetables that were produced at the wrong time or were produced um, for a different segment of the supply chain and can't get to the place where it needs to be. Um, the tremendous challenges we've had around animal slaughter uh, due to uh, the pandemic in, 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 in our enormous slaughterhouses in this country and our vertically integrated system and very consolidated system. And then we have farmers who, um, because of our precise system of agriculture, just sort of this just-in-time supply chain when the hog is ready to go to the slaughterhouse. If it's not, if there's not the capacity because it's shut down or, or working at a different rate, um, many have had to been slaughtered and not even been able to get to someone who needs the food and is hungry. And at the same time, you can turn on your TV in America and see cars lined up, you know, for a very long way of people who have never been to food banks before, who have never had to access this kind of um, food assistance now being um, in this time of need, but not being able to access the food that is literally going to waste in the field um, and creating a whole other host of challenges for us. Um, we've, we've put some uh, funding levels into some of our earlier packages to deal with the fun pandemic, um, trying to increase uh, availability of food through school meal programs, through our SNAP assistance program. Um, the USDA has created food boxes, which um, attempt to access some of this food from a variety of suppliers and, and get them directly to people. Um, some of those issues we agree, some of those uh, solutions we agree with, some of them that we don't. Um, and we are proposing um, a, a different way of looking at this um, and a chance to open up looking at our entire supply chain, which is deeply connected to this issue of food waste. And so just a couple of, of things about that. Um, and I won't go into our whole comprehensive look about it, but we've been continuing to make suggestions and are looking for ways to use this crisis to reform some of the things in our system. We see a huge opportunity now to have much more support for local and regional agriculture. It's been an issue we've been working on for a long time, but particularly in this moment in time where our supply system has failed us and some of our consolidated systems have failed us, people have found that they can go in their community down the road and they can sign up for a CSA, which is a, you know, a, a way to access food, or they can buy from their local farmer, or they can even shop online and have a delivery made to their house in ways that we never accessed this technology before. It's a great way to support more local and regional agriculture and get away from some of the problems that we have of food waste in our in our very consolidated systems. Uh, we, we now see um, a need for many of the uh, things that were early discussed earlier, and that's the shortage of infrastructure. I've worked on for many years um, the uh, attempt to get more capacity in our, our local and small slaughterhouses because people are more and more interested in buying locally raised meat or, or having access to that, but there's often not the infrastructure capacity. So um, mobile slaughterhouses, um, more aid for small slaughterhouses. Um, also in other kinds of processing, it was just mentioned in the FAO um, suggestions that uh, we need a lot more infrastructure around fast freezing or processing food when we have too much of it, but it has to be more local and regionalized because uh, 
we're, we're not going to continually have the ability to have you know big farms that ship to one centralized freezer packing facility or canning facility so we are looking at a whole variety of those things and again have renewed interest in a way i've, I've never seen before and while it's a you know it's a it's a sad reference to a a huge challenge that we're facing today. It does force people to look at this supply chain that's been, um, you know, some of it directed strictly to restaurants and food service, which many of which are closed today, and some of which going directly to consumers. A change in interest of people wanting to buy more locally, a huge opportunities for our farmers to have these markets um, and to reduce um, that, 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 um, that waste that we're, we're um, seeing today. In the long run, in conclusion, you know, this is just critically important, um, as, as previous speakers have mentioned. Um, it, we are plowing so many resources into growing food in America today, and that is water, that is labor, things that we will not have um, at, 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 at the scale that we've had in the past. Our labor shortages are huge. Protecting people who work in, in uh, farm labor or Food processing labor is getting increasingly important um, as we look out into the future and also have to address the issues around climate change and limited supplies of things like water. We cannot keep over processing food and not getting it to the people who need. Um, this is an environmental problem as we all know food waste um, turns into methane gas and becomes some of the more toxic issues that we're dealing with in the environment. And as somebody mentioned earlier, it's just a moral issue. We cannot have so many people going hungry, whether it's in the United States or around the world, when we are literally dumping and destroying food because we cannot design a, a system that's appropriate to use. So I look forward to working with all of you. I think we're going to have um, uh, much greater opportunities in the United States um, to, to revise and change some of these things in our system. And, uh, you know, as, as has been observed, um, far from being a leader right now in fixing the problem, we are um, suffering from many of the challenges that countries around the world are experiencing right now. And that will give us only greater impetus uh, to fix those problems and um, to work both on a national and international level. So again, thank you so much for letting me join you. Thank you to everybody who's, um, you know, on this today and, and speaking about this and working on this, I think we have to all pull together and work together to solve uh, one of our biggest challenges today. Indeed, thank you so much, Congresswoman Pingree. And thank you for your inspiring words and also reminding us that this is an opportunity to tackle this issue, raise public awareness, that this is an environmental issue, which should not forget the environmental dimension of food loss and waste and also that uh, we have to look at the whole system. So thank you so much for your important work and your uh, inspiring remarks. We will now move to an interactive panel. We will hear first a private sector perspective, followed then by the two biggest food recovery organizations in the USA and Canada. Uh, we're excited to hear from Megan Stas, who is the Vice President of Packaging and Sustainability at the Consumer Brands Association. She joined the association in 2010 and has over 15 years of experience in the environmental sustainability field. At the Consumer Brands Association, Stas works on issues such as recycling, waste, sourcing, supply chain sustainability, and other topics that pertain to the consumer packaged goods industry. Among other initiatives, she's leading the national effort to address the broken recycling system. She also leads the Food Waste Reduction Alliance, a cross-industry initiative to reduce food waste uh, sent to landfills and increased food donations to food banks in the United States. Thank you so much for being with us, Megan. The first question to you would be, um, as Consumer Brands Association, you represent uh, companies which produce most shelf stable goods in grocery stores. What are some of the main COVID-19 impacts you have seen in your part of the private sector? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Florian, and thank you for having me to the whole FAO team. I think this has been such an interesting conversation already and it's such a critical issue. So I really uh, welcome the opportunity to participate today. Um, I'm Megan Stas, as Florian said. Um, I have two roles. Uh, one is leading sustainability for the Consumer Brands Association. Consumer Brands used to be a group called the Grocery Manufacturers Association. Some of you might have heard of us then, but Consumer Brands represents the leading food, beverage, and consumer product companies in the U.S. So our members are companies like PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, General Mills, Procter & Gamble, Clorox, companies like that. And then as part of our work, we also co-lead a major project on food waste called the Food Waste Reduction Alliance. And as Florian said, that's a cross-industry partnership 
between our organization, the National Restaurant Association, and then a group called FMI, which represents the leading grocery stores. So the three associations together run FWRA, the Food Waste Reduction Alliance, and we work on, on food waste issues in the supply chain and food donation. Um, it's also worth mentioning that I also live in Maine and Congresswoman Pingree is my representative from Congress. So you guys get a great Maine perspective today on this, on this webinar, um, like it or not. But uh, we've been working with her office for a number of years on these issues and really commend her, her leadership. Um, so to get to your, to your question, Florian, I think we've seen, you know, we, we as an industry have been working on food waste and food waste reduction in our operations and increasing food donation for the past 10 years. We started the Food Waste Reduction Alliance back in 2011, understanding just how critical these issues are to consumers and to the environment and to business. What we have seen with the COVID pandemic is an unprecedented disruption in our entire supply chain and in our entire lives. We have seen tremendous changes, not just in where consumers get their food and where they consume their food, right? So grocery stores were shut down, restaurants were shut down, um, you know, people changed, changed where they could get their groceries, how often, but we also saw a change in what consumers were getting, right? As, as the Congressman was mentioning, you know, for the first time, many Americans were, were seeing um, stockouts, unavailability of product on, on shelves. And so, and, and so as we look at this supply chain and these tremendous disruptions, I think we, we have a lot of really great lessons to learn and also a lot of really great examples of how innovation and collaboration and quick thinking, frankly, across the supply chain can keep those critical infrastructure, that critical food system running and getting it to, to, to all kinds of consumers, but especially those in need. I think the, the disruptions that, that the Congressman mentioned of seeing um, products getting plowed under at the farm level or farm animals going to waste and then you know, huge long hours lines at food banks here in the, in the US, we were, they were heartbreaking stories. And I think we've seen some great innovation in um, recognizing those breaks in the supply chain and finding ways, ways to fix them. So the major impacts of COVID that we have seen from a food waste perspective were really around such a disruption in where consumers are getting their food, but then also what they're getting in terms of reduced, you know, in terms of perishable food not being available, uh, changing their purchasing habits in terms of buying maybe more shelf-stable food and the like. Um, and so it's been, a, it's been a very interesting journey and I think we've got some great examples to share on the panel today from an innovation perspective. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, you already mentioned the Food Waste Reduction Alliance. So what new challenges and also opportunities do you see for food recovery in the current pandemic? Yeah, I think that's a really good one. The reason that we launched the Food Waste Reduction Alliance back in 2011 is because we recognize not just the importance of food waste reduction and food donation, but also the critical nature of collaboration. What we recognize is that food waste happens all along the supply chain. And so it's going to take all of the partners in the supply chain to reduce food waste in our operations and, and make sure that we're getting food to those in need. So I think one of the things that we have done very well through the Food Waste Reduction Alliance is those ideas around cooperation and collaboration. But I think especially with the COVID pandemic, it's well, what can we do, do more of? And just last year, for example, the Food Waste Reduction Alliance signed a um, um, memorandum of understanding and agreement with three federal agencies here in the US with the Environmental Protection Agency, the US Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration to collaborate, collaborate and work together around food waste issues, but especially around ways, raising awareness, um, strengthening uh, understanding of liability protections for those who donate food and finding ways to get more infrastructure options um, in different parts of the United States so that when we do have food waste, it's not going to landfill. So it's going to compost or it's going to make energy. So those kinds of partnerships, I think, are really critical. 
And one of the things that we saw during the COVID pandemic, I think, was an unprecedented amount of partnerships and eagerness to engage through FWRA and others. I know the American Trucking Association, for example, launched a really tremendous initiative to pull together a broad group of stakeholders to provide a forum for all sorts of partners throughout the supply chain to identify uh, solutions or, or ideas that they might have to solve some of these immediate supply chain disruptions that we were seeing. And now that the pandemic and the supply chains have started to get to a more normal or a little bit calmer state, um, the Trucking Administration, the Trucking Association is looking at um, building out some work on how can we learn from this? How can we make our supply chain more resilient so that if there are shocks like this um, in the future, that we as the full food and beverage um, and retail and restaurant supply chain how can we make sure that we don't see those major disruptions again? So I think, again, that collaboration, cross-industry partnership, it's so critical to our, our work here. Thank you so much. Indeed, uh, if food loss and waste is really a multi-sector issue, it needs multi-sector action. Um, now, with the crisis, there seems to be an increased use of food packaging, single-use plastics, which often ends up in landfills, soils, and oceans, about which many consumers are concerned about. Uh, what role do you see for more sustainable packaging and recycling systems? Yeah, I think if COVID taught us anything, it is that there is a need for all different kinds of, of packaging and products, and also a need for recycling systems that can handle those, those, that packaging and those products. Packaging plays this really critical role in getting food to consumers safely and with quality intact. And especially during the COVID pandemic, the safety of food and food packaging was really on, on full display. As consumers use more food at home, especially more packaged food at home, it's really clear that we need a recycling system throughout the US and certainly around the world that can handle that packaging, that can use that packaging to make it back into packaging, make it into another product, and absolutely keep it out, not only out of landfills, but out of the environment. So I think there's a role to play for this kind of packaging, especially from a food safety and quality standpoint. And especially as we think about um, supply chain disruptions and resiliency of the supply chain, but we also have to have a resilient recycling system and waste system that can handle and process that. Excellent. Thank you so much. My last question to you is, what is the key lesson learned from this pandemic and what would be your call for action? I think it's really resiliency and, and creativity. As, as we have looked at some of the actions that were taken, even just by, by my member companies, I think we've seen just some tremendous innovation and a commitment to doing the right thing. Uh, we know that um, General Mills, for example, um, repurposed one of their uh, lines of operation and, and did a whole run of $5 million worth of uh, food that they produced and sent directly to donation. And that was shelf-stable products like granola bars, frozen breakfast items, cereals. We know that Kellogg has, has given $7.5 million in food and funds for, for food donation. PepsiCo has donated over 50 million meals. You know, we've really seen some creative repurposing of, of supply chains or maybe parts of supply chains or operational lines or you know, companies really stepping up creatively to, to do their part. But I think the call to action here is how can we look at these, at our supply chains holistically? How can we look at these challenges from a resiliency standpoint and try to take some of the lessons learned that we've learned and make sure that we're applying them to the supply chains of the, of the future? Perfect. Thank you so much. If you have further questions for Megan, please put them in the chat box and we will try to address them in the Q&A session. Our next speaker is uh, Blake Thompson, who is Chief Supply, and Supply Chain Officer at Feeding America. Blake has built a long career in the food industry and has extensive end-to-end -end supply chain experience. He has had resp responsibility for every function of the supply chain, including demand planning and management, sourcing, procurement, transportation and logistics, technology, production, research, development, quality, and safety. Thank you so much for being with us, Blake. 
Uh, as chief supply chain officer, you're responsible to increase the amount of nutritious food available through the immense Feeding America network uh, with over 200 food banks for people facing hunger. What are some of the impacts you are seeing in supply chains and food donations? Yeah. Glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation to uh, attend this forum and I think it's great work. And uh, I've been with Feeding America for almost two years. Um, and this is my um, uh, first uh, entry into um, uh, a uh, not-for-profit and charitable food uh, that's been interesting. Um, you know, to, to your question on what we've seen with donations, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, there was a huge run on retail grocery uh, items. Um, Megan pointed those out, created a huge demand and reduced supply. One of our largest uh, donation streams our organization is retail uh, food. And that put a very uh, hard um, uh, uh, decline in some of those food streams uh, that we were realizing prior to uh, uh, COVID. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the impacts extended all the way into the manufacturing arena in the retail segment. Um, it, it forced our, our network to begin to purchase more shelf stable food to fill the gaps. Um, in the declining channel. Um, we're still purchasing at a higher level of shelf-stable food as the supply is constrained. And this is not a um, uh, uh, financially uh, 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 sustainable way of supporting food, charitable food uh, for our system. Uh, but, um, you know, and as schools, Megan pointed out, schools and restaurants and places of work were shutting down we saw the food service industry uh, see a, a very significant decline in their business, which, which, which caused inventories to back up through their supply chain. Uh, we were very fortunate to get a lot of donations early on uh, as the response to COVID occurred um, from local distribution centers um, and food service companies. Um, mostly it was the the perishable foods, so the dairy, protein, and produce items were very plentiful at the very beginning of COVID through the, the um, food service channel. Um, we, um, we've also seen a um, increase in our uh, availability of, of really protein and dairy and produce. That's been our primary go-to foods uh, as we've tried to make up some of the other channel declines that we've seen. They've been available. Um, and uh, however, um, a lot of the food service product is not uh, conducive to distribution in the charitable food system. So we've, we've acquired as much of that food as we can, um, and our food banks are just not in a position uh, to uh, be able to repackage that food in distributable format. So that's another obstruction within the supply chain of being able to get food that's available uh, from source to where food may be needed through the charitable food system. Um, the, the, uh, the increase on the, on the uh, uh, food service side has not fully uh, filled the gap of the retail food decline that we've seen. And more of our efforts have been around the um, uh, produce and dairy items uh, that have uh, more abundance and more applicability to, to our system. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we've talked a little bit about the supply side. Could you let us know on the demand side, what are some shifts in demand you're seeing uh, in your networks and what are some of the biggest challenges facing food banks in the U.S. at the moment? So not only have our food banks been challenged with increasing demand, we've seen about a 60 percent increase for demand at our, our network food banks for charitable food. Um, some of that demand is coming from um, and Russell pointed it out, uh, people that have not uh, used the charitable food system in the past. So there's a new entry into this, this need. Um, we've seen um, uh, the increase in demand. At the same time, we've been impacted with a decline in volunteers. So the issues around social distancing and protecting our uh, uh, food bank uh, employees, agency employees, volunteers, uh, and also our clients have uh, 
forced us to look at some very creative different ways from a distribution standpoint for the food. So demand has gone up. Uh, the, the distribution challenges uh, have been increased as well. Uh, our network reports that about 20% of our feeding agencies, partner agencies, uh, have closed or diminished, uh, reduced their operations as well. So that's required some different ways of thinking about how we distribute food. Um, the, uh, the requirements around zero touch uh, or no, no touch as well have been impacted uh, with uh, our operations for distribution. So um, we, it, it varies in our system, but we have food banks that have access to a lot of food. They have distribution uh, limitations uh, to distribute that food. In other areas, we have more distribution capacity and less food uh, to serve uh, those in need today. One of the items, it's, it's, it's kind of risen to the top uh, as a very significant um, um, uh, innovation in terms of being able to distribute more food has been these food pre-prepared -pre food boxes. So we have, we also uh, within the food banks have, um, have, have been preparing food boxes with as much shelf stable food as we can acquire, but we've also uh, been uh, afforded food boxes through the USDA, the CFAP program that started in June. And those have primarily been around produce, dairy, and protein items in those food boxes. And those we've seen we've seen millions of those boxes since since June. Excellent. And thank you so much and for the important work you do. Uh, what would you say? What is your key lesson you have learned from the pandemic? And what would be your call for action? So this I, I think we need to understand the scale of the problem. I think most most do, but this is huge, uh, food waste and also the need for charitable food. Uh, our food bank system, although it's huge, uh, will recover and distribute close to 6 billion pounds this year uh, across the United States. Um, uh, we're only part of the solution of this problem. And I think uh, Representative uh, Pingree uh, called it out perfectly is, this is, this is an issue of overproduction and it's also an, an, an issue of, of, for food banks, getting access to more affordable food and also having to overcome some of our distribution challenges uh, with infrastructure, whether it's cold chain trucks, uh, but more distribution capability to serve more food to those in need. Excellent, thank you so much, Blake. Uh, if you as audience have further questions to Blake, make sure to put them in the Q&A box, addressing them, mentioning to whom you address the question and please stating your name and affiliation. We will now move to Canada and hear from Laurie Nickel, CEO of Canada's leading food rescue organization. And uh, as a parent who suffered from food insecurity, Laurie is acutely aware of the impact of food access and healthy food for people her advocacy around universal child nutrition has resulted in millions of funding dollars directed to student nutrition and through a community development model. The leadership has changed the way Canada manages food loss and waste. As CEO of Second Harvest, she saw an opportunity to pivot a local food charity that distributes fresh, healthy food into a national food network uh, and uh, food recovery. Her initiative and collaborative approach on food recovery includes both logistical and technical approaches to ensure that local communities' needs are met. She created the national food sharing mobile app, foodrescue.ca, which uh, is changing the way charities access food from coast to coast. To mitigate the detrimental impacts of COVID-19 on food insecure people, she immediately built a Canadian national task force with government and industry leaders to ensure supply could meet demand without oversaturating the charity bill sector with one commodity. And uh, thank you so much for being with us today, uh, Laurie. My first question, our first question to you would be, uh, could you tell us more about the situation in Canada and which COVID-19 impacts uh, you are seeing as Canada's biggest food rescue organization? Well, thanks so much first for having Canada on the panel. We're just delighted to be here, so yay. Um, so COVID-19 hit us pretty hard and pretty fast as it did everybody. We pretty much shut down uh, the middle of March. Um, and that really impacted not just the food system, but the charitable sector. 
So for our organization, immediately we went with safety first, obviously, as everybody did, made sure that our staff had the appropriate PPE, we understood what physical distancing was, we stopped having volunteers immediately, and all of our office staff went home and we started working from home. And that was really, we want to role model that to all the organizations that we support, of which there are many, many of them. Second Harvest is unique in that we, we are 90% perishable and we don't purchase any food. It's all food rescue. And that means um, we have a logistics system in place, but not a huge one all over the country. And this food, from the food services stopping immediately, our hotels, our restaurants, everything was closed. It really increased the amount of surplus food that was available, but also in a way that was difficult to manage for uh, families because they were large packages. So we had to figure out a way of managing that in the best way. We also had meal programs that shut down. And so what happens to those community dining places? They shut down, the homeless shelters still need food. We were fortunate in that the philanthropic sector, the corporate sector really got behind food during the beginning of the pandemic and continued to do so. And so Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment started, uh, they turned their, they turned the NBA uh, basketball court into a meal production site, producing I think half a million meals to date. And they're individually packaged to ensure that they're kind of grab and go because the whole charity sector changed in an instant. So much of it is um, supported by our seniors population and our seniors were told to go home because this was, they had compromised immune systems and this was a, a demographic that really should not be out in public. And so uh, many of the organizations just stopped and many other ones just kind of popped up. To, so it was a whole logistical change too of how do we manage all these new places. And, and Second Harvest, we're not membership based, we are opt in. We have food. We've done the research in Canada, 58% of all the food we produce is lost or wasted. There's more than enough food to feed everybody. So let's make sure that they can have it. So COVID has changed us also in terms of we're a big country with not very many people. So just getting food from certain areas, like from the south of, on, of Canada, where most of our population is on the south, to the north of Canada has required a, a really significant infrastructure change. And that means um, trucking food up to northern parts of Ontario and then uh, having planes fly them into fly-in communities. And really, I think what that did with COVID really showed us a disparity between rich and poor in a way that Canadians, I don't believe, had seen it before. It was the first time that people with money, I think, felt hunger because they went to their grocery store and said, oh my goodness, there's nothing on the shelves. And that was the first time they kind of could identify with it. And so I think a lot of that has, has really just changed and opened a lot of Canadians' eyes to the reality of, of the, the hunger that is in a, a developed country, a wonderful country, but it exists. So our response has been swift and we are doing the best we can with all the support that we're getting. And it's been um, in, incredible, I think, how we've managed. Thank you so much for these insights. Um, today we're trying to showcase holistic approaches to reduce food loss and waste and food insecurity at the same time amid the pandemic. So could you tell us more about the collaborative approach you're championing in Canada and how you coordinate with civil society, government, private sector and even indigenous people I read? How did you do that? Uh, immediately we recognized that we needed to collaborate. The only way that we're all going to change the world is together and we know that. And so on March 18th we created we're, we're a bit behind Megan. Sorry, Megan, I'm so happy to hear this. So we created a national task force. It was the Food Rescue Canadian Alliance National Task Force. And that got charities, big charities, national, regional, United Ways, Red Cross, food banks, um, industry, and that was retail to farm commodities and together in a room to really understand where the spikes in food are and where the gaps in so that we could connect the dots on that. We also did that with uh, the federal government. They were part of the committee of the task force, uh, Agri-Food and Agriculture Canada. And we had an indigenous uh, working group as well because we have communities that people are often overlook um, and second harvest goal is always to leave no one behind. Like there are in urban centers, there's often a, 
a fair amount of support, but in those more rural, remote settings, how can we ensure that food gets to those communities? And so what we found was a lot of people wanted to help. So even getting into the north, instead of creating new systems, how can we piggyback on existing ones? And so we worked with Northern Stores uh, to allocate uh, funding and food to make sure that they could have it in the south. We worked with all the charities, all industry, farm, manufacturer, processors, you name it, government, regional, municipal. We all got together to make sure that we could ensure all of this surplus food, of which there is, has already been a significant amount and has only increased, could get out before it got into landfill. Because second harvest first, we're no waste, no hunger. We really see the environmental imperative of keeping food out of landfill, and we want to make sure people access that food. And so we can only do that through collaboration, and that's what we continue to do. Indeed, indeed. Could you briefly tell us about uh, the role you see for digital innovation, especially under the current pandemic? Well, I think there's a role for all kinds of innovation. Um, we're fortunate, I feel like some of the things we did, it's almost as though we knew this was coming. Uh, we created an online platform and a mobile app called foodrescue.ca. Again, an opt-in system for food businesses and for charities and nonprofits that they opt in. If you need food, it's there. We already knew it was there. We already, and we had already just completed a mapping of all the charities and nonprofits across Canada, which had not been done before, to learn that there are 60,000 of them. 60,000 places, we have 58% of all the food that is lost and wasted. Let's use a system that will map those on top of each other to make sure that they can connect. Digitization also does something else that's incredibly important, and that's centralizing. It centralizes the data so we have a better understanding of where the food is, how much is available, how much is being used. Um, and it's, again, it's opt-in. So there's no kind of like you can use it with dignity. Everybody's using it. There's no poverty uh, mandate that you have to be low income or be suffering from hunger to use it. If you're a charity or nonprofit, just access the food. It's there. So digitizing has been really critical across Canada for food. During the pandemic, we were able to allocate funding that we received from the government of Canada uh, in the form of grants, about to $20,000. We had uh, philanthropists give us funding that they wanted to allocate. We could use that existing tool because it was in every community across Canada to allocate food, funding, grocery gift cards, take surveys, collect data. I think digitization and ease of use is going to be what's critical for businesses to get on board everywhere. Indeed, that sounds fascinating. And my last question to you would also be, what is the key lesson we've learned from the pandemic and what would be your call to action? I think the boldest interventions, the systemic interventions are the only ones that are gonna save the world. And in Canada, we had a Canadian emergency response benefit, which is basically a basic income and it still exists across Canada to ensure that, you know, it doesn't get so, so bad. And I think keeping those kind of systemic systems in place, we learned, we learned that there's a, a lot of food we've, uh, across our food system that needs to be rescued, but also needs to be processed. And what is that, what is the funding available for that to happen to make sure that we can process food, slow release it across our country. So it's not bang, bang, bang. There's a billion potatoes, please take them. It's, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of everything. So those would be, oh, you know what the final one would be? Value food. Food is made for life. The commoditizing of food has really been our downfall. The lack of a systems approach to food systems has been our downfall. And one of the greatest reasons we have so much food loss and waste. That's it, I'm done. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, we will now conclude the North American panel and we'll move to a global perspective again, because there's one important aspect we haven't talked about it yet in detail. And that's the importance of accessing real-time information and data. So we probably all have heard the phrase, what gets measured gets managed, which is also true for food loss and waste before a pandemic and also during the pandemic. And often we see there's a big gap between perceived and actual levels of food loss and waste. Um, so we have the pleasure to have with us, uh, before we go to the Q&A session, Carola Fabi, who's a senior statistician at FAO, 
leading a team on methodological innovation. And she also is the focal point for SDG indicator 12.3.1, also known as the food loss index. Corolla, over to you. And we're looking forward to hear more about the importance of real-time information during COVID-19 and new and innovative ways to understand the pandemic's impact on food chains. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Florian. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. So I'm uh, uh, Carola Fabian from the Statistics Division of FAO. So I'm going to share my screen. I, have, I will start with a short presentation and then we will move into the um, uh, directly um, uh, into the, the, uh, the big data platform uh, that FAO developed. Can you see the screen? I'm sharing, huh? am I? Yes, we can. And uh, can you see now the um, uh, the PowerPoint, the um, the PowerPoint? I mean, the full screen PowerPoint. Is it yes, still? Yes, uh, full okay, screen. Okay. Right. So, really, the question is, you know, what are, what are the challenges in uh, in measuring food losses and waste, and uh, and I'm really trying to. Uh, I would like uh, really to to advocate for the importance of data and yet uh, the, 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 the need to find alternative solutions and alternative data sources in a situation of need and in an unprecedented uh, crisis like the one uh, the world is, uh, is going through. So this is really just to, to set the stage. Uh, maybe some of you, uh, I mean, I hope all of you have heard of the SOFA report of FAO of, 2000 and, of last year of 2019, whereby uh, FAO updated the global estimate for food losses and set the new percentage all over the supply chain only, so not including consumption and the retail sector at 13.8%. And uh, the data was also available by commodity group, like you see a slide, and by uh, country group. Now, to get to these results that are extremely aggregated, it took two years. It took two years to build the model, two years to check the data, and yet these figures are extremely aggregated, and they, are, uh, they give a snapshot, they give an overview, one can turn them into aggregate value, it's over $400 billion worldwide, but they are not sufficiently detailed then to make a decision and to reduce losses in a specific supply chain, in a specific situation, like we have heard, uh, and you have, the other analysts have explained uh, uh, during their presentations. And uh, uh, what I mean is that this is a representation of the officially available data, of the official data underneath the model. Of all the countries in the world, only 39 countries officially reported data on food losses to, through uh, FAO's agriculture production questionnaire starting uh, many years back. So we're talking about a 30 years uh, long time series. And of the data that the countries produce, many are estimated on fixed loss factors. So they are useful to set a benchmark, they are useful to make an overall, uh, uh, an overall estimate of food supply, but of course not to uh, monitor the impact over time or the change over time, because it, it has been set a priori. The losses are 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 percent of whatever uh, commodity is being, uh, is being produced um, in a certain country. Um, the columns are commodity groups, uh, and on the left one see good coverage for cereals, somewhat good coverage for roots and, tuba, uh, roots and tubers on the right, but the center is actually quite empty, and the very center is made meat and dairy, and actually it's in dairy, it's in the dairy product. Uh, product and it's, and it's on eggs that there have been a lot of uh, a lot of losses recently. So one sees that the uh, official data that are available not only are they scarce, but they do not address the immediate need uh, that the community and the countries uh, are uh, having right now uh, for uh, for that. By the way, this uh, all these figures are available in an online database on food loss and waste factors uh, that the FAO has published. It contains official data as well as data from literature review, so it allows to delve in uh, case studies and specific commodities and, uh, and so on. So what happened that with the COVID, there have been unforeseen impacts on the value chain. And when it comes to food losses and waste, the first news 
appeared in April. In April, Reuters published uh, this article of this huge warehouse full of potatoes, 1,000 uh, 1, tons, getting rotten because restaurants had closed with a shutdown and there was no demand for the side serving of uh, French fries that is so common in uh, any Western style uh, restaurant. A uh, few days later, the New York Times, this big uh, article of uh, uh, what happens on the farm, so smashed eggs, plowed in vegetables, that's the picture actually, these vegetables are being plowed in back into the soil. And uh, uh, so uh, food waste at the farm level due to the COVID pandemic because of disruptions in the uh, value chain. And this, is happen this happened very, very fast. It couldn't be reflected and it can't be reflected in uh, uh, in any systematic uh, official uh, data collection system. At the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, the COVID has had an impact on national statistics systems as well. Uh, there have been signals of value chain disruptions, but they, I mean, when it comes to the statistic systems, we are facing the risk of a partial of total blackout of the statistic systems, so of data collection, uh, in a moment when Key resp a quick response is the key, and one needs, on the contrary, real real time data to understand what is happening, to know how to to decide how to take action, and to make sure that uh, the action has been effective. So, in order to apply the same uh, intervention uh, in other situation, so and what happened, for example, is that in April. Four countries uh, suspend face-to-face -face interviews because of the lockdown. Now, uh, and here one sees how the COVID increased the digital divide because Western countries have got also a lot of digitized data collection, telephones, interviews, uh, internet, and so on, uh, registers of all sorts. Uh, in um, in uh, low-income countries with a higher uh, literacy rate, the interview is the way to collect the data. So the risk is that next year or at the end of this year, there will be even fewer data around and not only on food losses and waste, but overall uh, on, uh, on many other uh, statistical, uh, in many other statistic areas and in particular, of course, agriculture statistics that are uh, our main, uh, our main concern. And when it comes to food losses and waste, I mean, the, the contradiction is even more striking because the need is really for real-time information, what to do with that warehouse full of potatoes, what to do with those eggs and that milk that is getting spoiled in the absence of a uh, baseline. So that is how the big data tool came to being. It's about thinking about alternative data sources, and these alternative data sources are the news. There is a lot of information around, but it comes through news, the social media, uh, the newspapers uh, publishing, uh, publishing information and so on. I'll uh, take just one more uh, slide and then we will go to, to the, we will go to the, uh, to the platform. So what kind of analysis can be done? This is a kind of analysis here. I have taken uh, the selection of articles that Rosa has delved into in, uh, uh, in her presentation. So we are in a position where what one can see to analyze the news and see what they show. So on food losses and waste in particular, first of all, we see the geographical coverage. The Western world is publishing more news. So the Western world is better informed. In fact, here, uh, almost 40% of the set of news are about the US and in Canada, that's uh, over 40, 40%. The other interesting thing that has emerged is that when one looks at the commodity groups, in fact, um, no, a lot of news are about the dairy, egg, the dairy sector, eggs, meat and fish. So, with a, uh, so what one sees is that while uh, so far the emphasis was on cereals because cereals are the staple, there are a lot of cereal losses during storage and on the farm and so on. During the COVID pandemic, the situation has changed very quickly because cereals are non-perishable. We are in a situation uh, of uh, actually uh, good harvest, uh, good production in 2019 and high stocks. So cereals are not uh, at the center. Uh, that's where there are more data, but they only make 4% of the news uh, in this, uh, this group. So what did we try to do? And here I need to uh, change uh, the... Um, 
I need to change the, the, the screen that I am sharing and uh, I go to, here we are. Okay, so, so we did was to focus, to try and find the news sources, uh, the best news sources that were events of information on the impact of the COVID on the value chain. So we set uh, a set of automated queries. This website is automatically updated every day but, uh, using uh, with uh, news found on the internet, uh, with a set of keywords that include food loss and waste, but also uh, a number of keywords about food chain disruptions and economic impact of the COVID worldwide. Um, there, are, there is a database of the tweets of 300 uh, newspapers worldwide, all their tweets. So there one can do a free search on any topic of interest, not only the COVID, not only food loss, losses and waste, and not only food. Um, and, uh, and then we have developed some uh, um, uh, additional uh, analysis on that. So for example, here I am showing uh, one of the analysis that we uh, do on uh, the newspaper tweets. We see by country the newspaper tweets, what do they focus on, which are the keywords that emerge. I, uh, I clicked on Argentina before. So we see is that in Argentina now the COVID is very much associated to the word food. One month ago the word uh, COVID was associated to uh, the economy, and debt because there was a risk of default of the country. So this is to say that this uh, chart is updated regularly and it points at what are the problems uh, of a country for, uh, over time. Another, uh, when you look here on the top uh, on the menu, we have a page uh, with uh, daily food prices of 14 commodities from a website that crowdsources uh, prices on a daily basis. And uh, we have uh, given access to the two databases. So this is a data, the database on the tweet, of the tweet. It's on tweet search. You need to register, but really a very simple operation. And uh, while uh, Dori, Florian was uh, introducing me, I just typed food shortage to see what came up. So with food shortage, one can see immediately that there is a new, uh, there is an atoll in uh, Nepal, uh, that there is actually even something about uh, food shortage for uh, fish uh, in, uh, in Finland and so on. So one can find, uh, I mean, and this is a semantic search engine, so you can really put uh, the words uh, that you want. It also automatically translates these words into the six languages that are managed. So, um, for, uh, I mean, if you type wheat, you might find some French articles about French-speaking countries uh, that talk about wheat in French. Uh, the other, another page is a news search. So here we don't have the newspaper tweets, but we have a wider set of news. Uh, as you can see, the interface is exactly the same. We have now 28,000 news, also selected with enough keywords, including uh, the 27 most traded commodities. And you can filter them on the right as you wish. So for example, if we filter for uh, food loss and waste, there are 360 news. So it's a small share of, uh, of the total. And here again, it's a semantic search engine, so you can uh, uh, drill down in your search uh, as much into detail as, uh, as needed. Uh, the last thing that we uh, added uh, last week actually is a digest. So every day uh, we publish uh, the, uh, we highlight actually the most important news of the previous day with uh, uh, in three chapters. So these are the menu on food chain disruptions in the broader sense. The impact on commodities and food prices. So uh, the drill down uh, here, for example, we see sweet potatoes in Kenya, Vietnamese lychee, or uh, an article of the Global Price Watch. Countries response. So a focus on the measures and some articles about what countries are doing and about what. It can also help for inspiration, seeing uh, what is being done uh, elsewhere. 
and a regional focus. So this, uh, again, I mean, uh, three regions, uh, the, a highlight for, uh, uh, for three regions in the world. This is really the, I mean, I gave a very, very quick tour. Uh, I hope I didn't overflow my 10 minutes. Uh, I will be happy to, to reply to more questions on uh, the culture, the method, uh, and so on. Just to conclude, uh, I mean, the, the conclusion is really that, uh, in fact, one sees uh, one can pay very dearly the lack of data. So, uh, in fact, the, 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 I would really like to advocate um, uh, on the importance of uh, not disrupting data collection uh, aside from uh, you know uh, activities. Uh, I mean, it's it's an important activities that serves uh, decision making and uh, and policy making. And of course, we have also seen and we have learned uh, all the advantages of digitization. Uh, digitized information has been immediately available and can be shared and it is open it can be openly shared and uh, it is actually the one way to to provide a quick response uh, of course the coverage is the same it's not comparable i mean there are all sorts of caveats uh, when it comes to treating this information as real data but it is nevertheless uh, real time it describes what is actually happening and so uh, it can help uh, making decisions and mitigating the impact of COVID on uh, food chains and uh, hopefully on food losses and waste. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Carola. And we encourage all of you to explore this new big data tool and see what in your countries, what media reports are covering, what community items, what are the new issues coming up. So we invite you to explore this tool. We will now move into the Q&A session answering questions from you, the audience. And uh, I would like to start with Laurie Nickel. There seems to be some disbelief that uh, the percentage of food loss and waste in Canada was estimated at 58%. So I was wondering if you wanted to clarify that number and also uh, if you have any recommendations for food waste and food rescue in schools. Sure. So we did, the, we hired Value Chain Management International, who are world-renowned researchers on food loss and waste to actually uh, do the research from across the supply chain. And so I recommend everybody go to the www.secondharvest.ca slash research. Um, it'll show you exactly where across the supply chain and why things are wasted. And it has, I think, 200 recommendations on how to ensure that we, uh, we waste less and the first one, as I think we all agree, is measurement. The reality is in Canada, and I think everywhere else, uh, we're not measuring it, or we're not measuring it consistently. And so this was the first time we were using primary data across Canada to determine that. Oh, and in schools. So schools, I love that question. My background is in child nutrition. In Canada, we do not have a national federal program for child nutrition. And um, so I had to start one in my own child's school. And the first thing I did was knock on a retailer's door and say, can I have your surplus food? So we know that there's a lot of extra food in the system and most of our schools are doing that already. Uh, we're working with um, school boards to do this in a more systematic way to ensure that the food is um, more regular, let's say, like of the different types of food. So you've got produce and it's always a pineapple or something, but there's a lot of opportunity to push that great food perishable produce, dairy, and protein into the school system that is community-led. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is for Blake. So uh, you mentioned that some of the distribution centers had to close. Uh, could you give us uh, any sense of what percentage of distribution centers had to close and uh, how much was the increase in terms of demand, which I think you mentioned, which was 60%, but could you let us know about the uh, distribution centers? So our, uh, our network estimated that about 20% of their partner agencies um, were diminished or had closed operations, so they were restricted. We had uh, a handful of food banks that had short-term closures to respond to outbreaks within their own food bank. So with in, in respect to getting in and doing sanitation and, and um, uh, restarting the food bank up, we had a few closures on that standpoint. For the most part, we've 
been very lucky that most of our food banks have had continuous operations through all this. Excellent, thank you. Uh, then we have a question to, question to you, Rosa, um, from Jagger Harvey, who's director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for reducing post-harvest losses at Kansas State University. And the question is, how is FAO integrating food safety into reducing food loss and waste? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, indeed, food, um, food safety is a, a cross-cutting element of all of the work that we do. Um, to address food loss and waste reduction in the supply chains in which we work. Um, you know, starting, I mean, whatever we do, especially when we're talking particularly, for example, in the crop supply chains, quality and safety are, are, are paramount in terms of assuring managing quality and assuring safety through this different systems of um, certification, but also different practical approaches uh, applied to address uh, food safety issues across the different systems in which we work. Um, it's not only crops, wherever in, in terms of livestock, in terms of fisheries, it is a very, very important dimension of FAO's work. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have one more question for Carola. What is the best met method for countries to measure food loss and waste? A survey, administrative records, and uh, could you share an example of a country which has um, successfully collected uh, most of this data? Yeah, uh, so uh, there, is no single, uh, there is no single method. In fact, uh, sample surveys are, um, especially uh, food loss surveys can be quite complex and, uh, and expensive. So uh, what we recommend is to use um, a, mix of, uh, a mix of methods uh, in order to keep costs, uh, direction costs under control. Uh, the sample surveys are providing the, um, let's say the, the soundest and representative results. So the best results in a situation where there are a lot of small uh, businesses and, um, and so the, uh, the only way to capture, uh, to capture the average, to capture the distribution and uh, uh, to have an accurate measure is to have a representative sample. So we are talking here about, for example, the small holders, the small farmers, the small holders in, uh, uh, in low income countries. Uh, when the market, uh, or the activity is uh, integrated and there are a few big actors, two large companies who are vertically integrated and who keep very accurate accounts and who have a sound um, grip on their, uh, uh, on their production processes and they know very well uh, how much they, they lose, then the, the company's records are, are, just, uh, are just as good. And um, uh, even, uh, uh, for example, when it comes to food processor, to have also some technical factors uh, from the industry uh, can, uh, can be uh, reliable enough uh, at, the, uh, at the count level. But if there are only few actors, of course, who cover the vast majority of the uh, uh, of market. Um, we are also uh, favorable to modeling losses, but then uh, when the model is entirely replacing uh, the collection, then it has to be uh, soundly tested and, uh, and developed. So it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's quite a demanding work at the beginning, then of course there are a lot of savings uh, down the road. I mean, on the, when it comes to updating uh, the model just with a few uh, uh, with a few variables huh? that's the uh, so um, but uh, to come back to the uh, to the, <laughs> the question uh, so because we uh, our guidelines uh, uh, and uh, our our documents i mean we uh, we strongly recommend the sample service but of course it is with in mind uh, the idea of a small uh, in, uh, I mean, of, a, uh, of an informal sector made of a lot of small, uh, of small actors. There, it is the, really the, uh, the only way to, to get to an accurate, uh, uh, an accurate estimate. Okay, thank you, Carola. And our last question goes to uh, Megan, 
Do you see, are there any plans in the Food Waste Reduction Alliance to help set up recycling infrastructure? Here we go. Um, the the um, Food Waste Reduction Alliance is not currently working on packaging recycling infrastructure, but we are working on food waste recycling infrastructure like anaerobic digestion or composting. But recycling infrastructure, especially in the US, is a critically important issue and project for the Consumer Brands Association. We know that we have to use packaging in order to get many kinds of food, especially highly perishable food, safely and with quality intact to consumers all around the world. And also that packaging can often really prevent waste and, and especially food waste, um, which has an enormous greenhouse gas impact and climate impact. So, um, but the recycling and the collection of that packaging is equally important to the waste prevention. So we have launched a major initiative around recycling, putting out a policy platform in April with some concrete ideas on how we think we can really fix the recycling system and the waste system here in the US um, to make it work better for consumers, for the environment, and, and for the business community. So it's a major initiative of ours. Excellent. Thank you so much, Megan. With that, we will conclude our session and we really thank all of you for bearing with us for almost two hours. It's such an important topic and we're happy that there's such a big interest in it. In conclusion, I think we've seen uh, that as with many other issues, COVID has really exposed and exacerbated some of the pre-existing challenges in our food system and that includes food loss and waste. And uh, reducing food loss and waste is crucial to increase the efficiency and sustainability of our food systems delivering better nutrition and food security, as well as environmental benefits. There is still an urgent need to raise awareness about the economic, social and environmental impacts of food and waste. And the coronavirus crisis could be a key moment to address these diverse and complex challenges that cause food and waste. Uh, we want to encourage you, all of you again, to observe September 29th as the first international day of awareness of food loss and waste as a new opportunity for action that will come every year and invite you all to join the global campaign. One further announcement on 13th July, the 2020 State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report will be released at the High Level Political Forum in New York, which will include updated numbers on global undernourishment and malnutrition and underline the need to transform global food systems for affordable healthy diets. On July 14th, we invite all of you to a discussion on the key findings of the report co-hosted by FAO North America and IFPRI, which will feature high-level speakers such as the FAO Director General Chu Dong Yu and IFPRI Director General Johan Swinnen. Please be on the lookout for this event announcement. Thank you one more time so much for our distinguished speakers, for our panelists, for all you as participants, for all the food heroes from farm to fork who keep our food supply chains going. We hope you stay safe and stay tuned. Thank you very much for joining us today.